Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Dodge. I'm a Senior Customer Success Manager here at Blameless. And today I'm joined by Clark Polo and Bradley Thomas from Better Cloud. We're going to talk to us about their reliability journey. So not only how they discovered Blameless, but how they built out their robust incident management process and started tracking reliability data. And then also a little bit about where they're headed in the future with SLOs and continuing to build out their SRE function. We're going to keep the conversation open. Uh, Brad and Clark have prepared some stories that they want to share, and I'll be asking questions along the way just to get more information about what they're speaking about and provide a little bit more details. As you're watching this along, online, if you have questions at any time, of course, you're welcome to reach out to us at Blameless. To reach out to us on Twitter, you can reach us at BlamelessHQ or email us at hello at blameless.com. Uh, and to contact Better Cloud, you can visit their website, which is www.bettercloud.com. Uh, and then you, if you want to email them, you can email them at info at bettercloud.com. All this information will be in the description box or the landing page wherever you're watching this video. Um, just a note here, a little bit on the agenda, of course, introductions. We'll talk about who Better Cloud is, um, incident management makeover that they went through, their payoffs and lessons learned, and then we'll have some closing remarks. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Clark and Brad to introduce themselves. Hi, everybody. My name is Clark. I'm a director of SRE and DevOps for our cloud engineering and optimization team here at Better Cloud, Clio for short. Uh, I've been in the reliability space for many years, and I've been in companies big and small and everything in between. So really looking forward to this webinar. <clears throat> yeah, and I'm, um, I'm Brad. Uh, I'm the uh, manager of SRE and DevOps here at Better Cloud, um, also in the same organization, um, Clio, as we like to call it. Uh, I've been uh, with Better Cloud for about five years as uh, a num in a number of different positions, finally as a people leader. Okay, thanks guys. Um, Clark, can you talk a little bit about Better Cloud in general and just kind of what space it lives in and give some details on that? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a big description here, but uh, in a nutshell, Better Cloud is a leader in the SaaS ops field. Uh, we enable automation, security, visibility for the dozens or even hundreds of SaaS products your organization may have. So instead of taking many manual administrative tasks and that may take hours and days to complete, Better Cloud can streamline all of that in a zero touch fashion. So just like DevOps did uh, in this day, uh, SaaS ops is going to be an industry defining practice that Better Cloud is leading. So please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you. Bradley, Bradley, can you talk a little bit about the state of InfraOps before using Blameless? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before uh, Blameless, we, we called incidents blockers. Um, and there was a tremendous amount of resistance even to that word, it, we, we, we had a fear response to, to the blocker, uh, to a blocker occurrence. Uh, teams would be reluctant to even call blockers. We, we wouldn't want to address things as incidents. Um, it, was really, it was really just very stressful for our, our software developers and uh, our site reliability engineers. Um, it was a cumbersome and manual process. We, we spent, oh man, I remember being in meetings, just hours talking about how to classify uh, what severity a blocker was or how many customers were impacted. And it was just all very awkward and unclear. To clarify, RACI is responsible, accountable, uh, consulted and informed. So uh, ultimately that ended up signifying that need for change, right? We couldn't keep that process up. It was just, it was untenable for the people working through that system and uh, the developers trying to solve the problems at the time. So that's understandable. And then you came up with a plan, um, you know, obviously you identified the need for change and then came up with a plan. What were some specific goals in that plan? And then, and then going forward, uh, what evaluation criteria did you use to evaluate Blameless? Um, right, so, um, the biggest part of the game plan was to go, was basically to reset expectations entirely. Um, we had to tap, we had to address like this culture of fear around blockers. Um, so we got rid of that word altogether. We rebranded blockers as incidents. Um, 
we, we wanted to make sure that we simplified our, our evaluation criteria just down to, to um, the impact on our internal partners and customers, and that's it. Um, uh, really, that was, the, that was the biggest deal. And overall, just simplification, right? We had to reset, uh, we had to reset completely. We, we were totally off on the wrong foot. Um, what we used, uh, the criteria we used to evaluate blameless was sort of the same criteria that we wanted, that we trained against when we started rolling out our new incident process. And that was really around uh, a tool that was built with the ICS or incident command system uh, from the ground up as its, as its ideal state. So that was really, uh, that alignment was pretty, pretty clean and straightforward actually. And I can say, well, to continue, the team that spearheaded this project uh, was cross-functional, uh, director from software development, uh, RVP of Clio, Stephen Dick, uh, myself, uh, and 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 Matthew as as uh, you as well as a partner for Blameless. And then, um, so that we we've talked about the identification of the need, and we've talked about uh, the plan. And then, so now once you had the plan in place, um, talk. Can you talk to us a little bit more about how that rollout worked? Um, you know, what did that onboarding look like with Blameless? Um, we also know, and this hasn't come up yet, but we also know that concurrently you were working with a incident response or incident management training agency. So how did those two, can you talk about how those two uh, simultaneous trainings uh, coupled together well, and, and, and then also kind of what stood out uh, what were the what were the biggest or, or most stark standouts from the before and after? Gotcha. So um, the easiest thread. So there's a couple of pieces that we can unpack there. Obviously, uh, the the one thread that draws through all of it uh, is ICS, the Incident Command System, used by FEMA and the FBI. Um, it is the training agency was focused on how ICS works in a, a real life incident management process, and Blameless is a tool that was designed around that incident management process, which with defined roles like uh, an incident commander, the incident communications officer, how they relate and, and how they run an incident uh, to make sure everybody's as effective as possible. So one of our strategy for onboarding with Blameless was, was, was pretty clean. The tool's pretty, uh, pretty easy to use. Uh, we, we did demos for uh, the, our team internally, lunch and learns, um, constantly reinforcing uh, how the, the tool connects with Slack and you can interact, it, interact with it entirely inside sort of this chat ops functionality. Uh, it's very, it's very neat. Um, public, we wrote and published clean and clear documentation, throwing out all the old stuff that we had around blockers and the, and the super complex matrix. So that was, uh, that was much cleaner, how to start incidents made it very clean and clear. Then to talk about the training that was focused on. So uh, our, our training partner that taught us the incident command system really gave us two big clean takeaways. One was reduce fear. The inc an incident is not anything to be feared. It's just an opportunity to improve. That was a big change. And also um, can reports, conditions, actions, needs. It's a way to communicate very cleanly and clearly to your internal and external stakeholders about what's going on with an incident so that there's less fear and less and, and less concern. And that's really the, what's, what we're driving down uh, across the board. We're just trying to drive fear down as a response. It's just, here's the information you need to know. Here's what we're gonna do to fix it. We've got, we are in control and have this in hand. So we've talked about this a little bit um, just through what you were just mentioning, but um, can you say a little bit more about um, were there any uh, bumps along the way uh, in terms of that? Because sometimes what we see is a, there's cultural adoption challenges. It sounds like from what you've said that uh, there everybody was pretty well bought in. Um, but did you run into anything during that transition that was maybe unexpected? Um, yeah, actually, I can say we constantly needing to reinforce the, the process is a surprise. It was always a surprise. It's like, I always, I, I, but I, I shouldn't have been surprised. It, it comes up a lot with any sort of process that you roll out that you just, when you start a new thing, you have to just constantly reinforce it to make sure, because you have change, new people into the organization, new 
uh, new ideas, just, hey, this is how we do, this is how we handle things here. And just making sure that we, so, so we miss sort of that onboarding piece and that reinforcement piece when, when people were joining the org as we grew and we grew a lot, so. Yeah, that's great news. And then, you know, we, we talked about a few of these things. We have a few of these stats here on the slide, but it does look mm -hmm. like you had a churn reduction. Um, you were saving a lot of time. Um, but then is there anything anecdotal really that's not a not a data point that you kind of noticed in terms of the effect that it had on the the org do you feel like um, you know we three examples there maybe those apply but maybe maybe something else can you speak to any of that I I would like to say that we have way less fear around incidents that we're using that we're using incident management and the incident process as a way to improve better cloud instead of this thing to be feared and avoided. And I think that's a big, uh, that's a big shift and it's, it's subtle, but I think it's really powerful. As a result, we've actually seen some incident, no, numbers of incidents increase, but that's okay. There's just more opportunities to improve. Do you feel as though it's maybe tipped in the other direction that it, we're, you have approached the incident as an opportunity um, or maybe not quite there yet? I don't know that we're quite there yet, but I definitely see that energy. It's we we just had um, our our leaders in, in the test automation space come and roll out a, a new kind of incident that we that we that we prototyped to sort of fill a gap that we had. Um, so I think we're seeing much more engagement with the idea of incident management as a whole. So that, I think that's where that you're going to start seeing that complete tip over into like, hey, this is an improvement opportunity, not a thing to fear or avoid. Okay, that makes sense. And then, of course, we see this quote here from Stephen, who you mentioned earlier uh, about the engineers actually enjoying interacting with the incident management process. And I think that that reinforces what you just mentioned. Yeah. Um, Clark, can you speak to some of these metrics that you're looking at today? Yeah. So uh, I came in in February of this year. So this is after the rollout of the new incident process. And I was very impressed about how well thought out the incident process um, was and is. Uh, it's very scalable, repeatable, uh, but metrics were very much missing. So that's kind of where I came in and started instilling some of these key metrics that we can look at and make sure that we're paying attention to and set goals towards. One of them being MTTR, mean time to resolve. Uh, you can see here that we're broken it down into, into different layers. So we have seven days, 30 days, 90 days, 120 days. And this is really taking the, the amount of time the incidents are taking to resolve and taking the average um, from all of the incidents. Uh, this is a really great insight because believe it or not, in Q1, we were, we were in the three figure zone. Uh, and one of our OKRs, one of our goals were to drive that down uh, by at least 25%. Uh, and we've been able to do that by 75% uh, just due to focusing on this and making sure we're better at this and uh, understanding where we have gaps that we need to address. Wow, that's actually really impressive, the 75% reduction. Um, and really just through what the process is or the realignment of the process that, that Bradley was talking about and not, not any other necessarily significant changes beyond we've revamped our process and now we have it, we've changed our approach and that in and of itself has led to the reduction. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if we don't know where we are, we can't, we don't know where we need to be. So just measuring our baseline and understanding where do we need to improve is just a big part of this. And yeah, happy to say that we're, we're doing just that. Um, can you speak more about the data here that you found um, just as an additional level? Yeah, absolutely. So this has been absolutely um, uh, essential for us as well in terms of collecting more metrics and data. Uh, there are a, a few things in Blameless that I'm working with Matthew on to add as a, as a feature. Uh, and Matthew and team have been great as to responding to those feature requests and adding them uh, incrementally. But if there are specific metrics that you need, uh, just a little uh, uh, tip, you can actually import the data into Tableau and you can, you can find the form, you, you, can, you can define the, the formulas in Tableau to really get the metrics you're looking for. In particular, mean time to detect and mean time to acknowledge. Uh, you can see here that our detection time is, is still pretty, uh, 
it's pretty wide. So we're trying to scale that down to be more reasonable. But again, having a good baseline and understanding where our goals are, that's really the, the, the intention here. Same thing with acknowledge. So we have a, a whole picture. How long is it taking for us to detect an issue? How long is it taking for us to acknowledge an issue once it's detected? And then from there, how long is it taking us to resolve an issue? So those three key metrics really help us understand the full picture. And now that we have a baseline moving forward, we can drive goals towards each metric. And when you're doing that goal setting, do you are you setting a goal based on a percentage change over time? Or is it more of a, a number goal? Or is it both? It's probably both. Uh, when I think about a world-class mean time to um, resolve, I'm probably thinking more along the lines of four hours or less. When I'm thinking about a, a world-class mean time to detect, I'm thinking uh, 10 minutes or less. So when we think about things from, from that perspective, there's a, big, there's a big opportunity there for these metrics, but now that we have that goal, we can spend each, each quarter to incrementally and by percentage work towards those goals. So that's really the approach that we're taking. Okay, that makes sense. And, and you spoke a little bit about some of these metrics and kind of where they live. And, and this graph looks like where that happens within uh, the workflow. So can you maybe walk us through this chart a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you haven't already picked it up, I'm a big metrics and data guy. <laughs> so uh, I love my metrics and I've been in a lot of companies and we, we talk a lot about MTTR, all these KPIs, but people kind of get confused about how we formulate those metrics and, and it gets lost in translation. So I wanted to be very clear here as to how we're formulating these metrics. Again, we have better cloud comprised of many services. If service X goes down, gets into an unhealthy state, how are we detecting that uh, unhealthy state? What is it through a human? Is it through a monitoring tool? Um, if it's through a human or, or a customer, uh, a customer support issue, uh, you know, those are things that we have to flag and make sure during the incident retrospectives we understand and how can we, um, you know, improve that. Uh, once it's detected, how long is it taking for us to acknowledge those um, uh, those issues? Uh, are we doing that in a timely fashion? Or are we kind of letting it sit, you know, in a, in a very long time period where the, the impact just continues to grow? Um, so that's a super important uh, metric that we need to calculate and. Time to resolve, of course. Once we acknowledge it, get into a, an incident uh, cadence, everyone gets into a chat, everyone starts understanding, identifying, engaging with each other, what needs to happen to fix the issue. That's the amount of time it takes to resolve the issue, finally resolve, gets back to a, to a healthy state. Our next metric that we're uh, instilling is MTBF, mean time before failure. Uh, basically, how long is it taking between incidents uh, and you know, what, what, is that, what does that metric look like? And from your, from your experience so far with Blameless, do you feel like Blameless is helping you with all of these? Um, or is there a certain area in Blameless that is Blameless is better served for or all of the above? 100% Blameless has helped us with all of these. This is something that I rely solely on Blameless to, to get all this information since uh, since all of our incidents flow through Blameless, they're all activated through Blameless, all of the data lives in Blameless, uh, and that's really our source of truth. So Blameless is really our enabler to make sure we have this data. Without Blameless, we wouldn't have this data. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. So in terms of, so we talked about the beginning, we've talked about that big change um, that Bradley spoke about, and when we talked about kind of the current state, um, Clark, can you take a couple of minutes and talk about what, how you see this advancing in terms of the future state that you hope to achieve? Sure. So when we talk about reliability, there, there's different layers to it. There's more of a crawl, walk, run phase. Our next phase here is to really get into that walk, getting into running phase is tracking SLOs. How do we understand SLOs stand for service level objectives? So from a, from a calculated perspective, SLOs are tracked, uh, are calculated by taking SLIs, service level indicators, and track and calculating them together and formulating a certain amount of nines. So if you have three nines, 99.9 .9 uptime, you expect that service to be within that range. If it ever falls outside that range, it's called an error budget. That error budget is then uh, tied back to that SLO and it should be tied back to a monetary value saying this error budget equates to this amount of money. So we need to focus on reliability, building this SLO back within budget. 
Um, and these SLOs are actually driven by critical user journeys. So when we think about critical user journeys, we're thinking about our customers. What do our customers need to do with our products to be successful uh, around the productivity uh, of Better Cloud, right? So it could be something as simple as logging in and hitting the homepage. That's a critical user journey, but it's very important. If a customer can't authenticate, log in, hit the homepage, then that's a problem that they can't use the product. So just tracking that one journey is super critical and making sure that we have SLOs to tie back to that journey. And of course, better automation. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things that Blameless helped us do to streamline the incident process, uh, all the way from uh, hitting a button and that'll kick off a Slack room, kick off a, uh, uh, kick off a uh, Google Meets uh, Hangouts channel, uh, making sure that, you know, we we're adding the right people in there's a couple areas that we can automate even further, right? So once we hit complete, we can uh, auto create a, a retrospective for that incident. Um, there's a lot of things that we can automate within our dashboards to automatically send out to the organization. So just better automation uh, as a whole is really the, the next steps here. Okay, well, thank you for that, Clark, and rather thank for your words as well. Um, hopefully that this has been really informative to anybody watching and kind of understanding that process or that journey really from identifying, identifying a need for a change um, and blameless being able to uh, in part or in whole really satisfy the need for that change um, and offer tools and functionality that help guide and standardize some of this incident, re incident management response uh, process and being able to empower you to uh, just really do more with it. Um, and I think we've shown this through the metrics that we spoke about and kind of the other things that we offer to Clark's point, being able to move into that SLO space is kind of a natural progression in the SRE model. Once you have the incident response process down and that retrospective process down, then you start to look to see what you can do more with metrics and observability, how you can continue to iterate on improving the, not only those metrics numbers that you see within Blameless, uh, but elsewhere as well. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, as I said before, at the top of the call, if you have questions for us, you can reach us on Twitter and that's here. And you can reach our, us by our website. You can also reach out to BetterCloud at info at bettercloud.com um, or go to bettercloud.com to learn more about their products and services.